In two previous videos, I covered interesting British ships in Egyptian service. The ex-HMS Mings sunk in harbor by F-4 Phantoms. And the ex-HMS Zenith, the last survivor of the war emergency destroyers. A ship that lasted at least up to 2016 before evidence runs out. And the ship was quietly scrapped. A sad fate for such a historic ship, but also a video I've already done. It's relevant to this one, however, because of something I stumbled on while covering Zenith. Namely, her longtime birthing partner, HMS Wimbrel. That ship remains in Alexandria. She was taken out of the water years ago and moved to a work area next to a new dry dock. Exactly what's going on there is something of an open question. As of this year, Wimbrel, most recently named Tariq, remains in place. However, we need to look at the rest of her service before we speculate on her ultimate fate. That story began on October 31st, 1941. On that day, Wimbrel was laid down in the Yarrow Dockyard. She would be launched about 10 months later on August 25th, 1942, and then commissioned on January 13th, 1943, where she would quickly be thrown into escort duty. Not surprising, because that's exactly what the ship was designed for. As a Black Swan-class sloop, Wimbrel was primarily used for convoy escort. This was a role that required long range, good stability, and the ability to hunt submarines. It did not require particularly high speed, as destroyers could and would handle anything involving that. Black Swans were designed to keep up with the ships they were escorting while being fast enough to run down U-boats, which, by all indications, they did quite well. However, with that said, it's time for the design detail. Wimbrel, as a first-generation Black Swan, displaced around 1,250 tons at her standard displacement. This allowed her to carry six 4-inch dual-purpose guns for her main battery. These were carried in three twin mounts, with two super-firing on the bow and one on the stern. By this point, a fairly standard design. To support those, Wimbrel also carried a mix of dedicated anti-aircraft weapons. Exactly which layout would vary depending on the time you're looking at. In general, though, it would have been 40mm pom-poms and 50 caliber machine guns. Specifically, a single quadruple pom-pom mount and a handful of machine guns. This would be reinforced over the course of the war as it always was. Although exact details on Wimbrel's layout are hard to come by, but we can look at the class as a whole for a good idea. This would generally see the pom-poms replaced by 40mm bofers where available, and the machine guns replaced by various numbers of 20mm cannon. Wimbrel also carried 40 depth charges, at least as designed. All of this was pushed through the water at 19 knots by 3600 shaft horsepower, through two shafts in this case. Again, not particularly fast, but more than capable of running down U-boats, which generally averaged around 18 knots on the surface. With that rounding off the design details, we can return to the surface history, with the disclaimer that much like Zenith and Ming's, there's not a lot of detail written on this topic. In any event, Wimbrel's service began, as mentioned before, on January 13th, 1943. The sloop would undergo her working up process at that point, lasting into March of 1943. Nothing particularly notable here, as all ships go through working up after their formal commissioning. The same went for anti-submarine training exercises in April. All of this prepared ship and crew for their combat service, which began for Wimbrel in June of 1943 specifically in escorting convoys. Her first role would see the sloop escort a military convoy to Gibraltar, including joining HMS Signet in depth charging a U-boat, U-409. That took place at some point between June 28th and July 7th, 
The U-boat would escape without damage, although U-409 would ultimately be sunk on July 12th. As for Wimbrel, upon conclusion of her escort duty, she was assigned to support Operation Husky. This saw her join support operations off the coast of Sicily on July 10th. Unfortunately, exact details are sparse. I'd expect it amounted to quietly patrolling around the landing operation. Had something notable happened, it would likely have been recorded. Regardless, by August, Wimbrel was back to convoy escorts in the Atlantic. This would see the ship escorting a convoy from Gibraltar to the United States in September of 1943, followed up by escorting another convoy back across the Atlantic, with neither seeing much in the way of action. This isn't terribly surprising by this point of the war. While U-boats were certainly still an issue, this was well past the happy times. The U-boat menace was no longer the threat it once was. This will become apparent as we look at the rest of Wimbrel's career. For example, she would participate in more convoy escorts from October through November 1943, which saw no action of note and was in general a quiet and uneventful time. Even the end of the year was quiet, with Wimbrel in refit from November 1943 through February 1944. When that was done, the sloop moved from the Atlantic to a much colder duty, that being the Arctic convoy run, which was generally more dangerous. I say generally because from all indications, Wimbrel's time here was just as uneventful. The run to Russia began on March 28th, 1944. This convoy would see some excitement in general. A couple U-boats were damaged or sunk, with German aircraft shot down as well. However, none of these actions seemed to have involved Wimbrel. Or, if they did, she didn't directly sink or shoot down anything herself. The same would hold true on the return trip, beginning on April 4th. Nothing major would happen during this run, with Wimbrel returning home to the UK by April 16th, 1944. This general pattern continued for the rest of 1944, for the most part. The lack of action, if not the convoy escort itself. For example, while May would see the ship participate in U-boat hunter-killer groups, Wimbrel did little of note herself. Her sister ships, like HMS Starling, got the excitement. And while the sloop would provide escort and support duty during the Normandy invasion in June, this saw no apparent combat. Valuable duty, don't get me wrong, but not the most exciting thing in the world. The same goes for further channel operations from July through August. Nothing of major note, ending with more time in refit. At the conclusion of those refits, in January 1945, Wimbrel was assigned to the Pacific Fleet. However, even this would prove to be quiet work. Wimbrel arrived in the Pacific in April, and spent the rest of the war in the back line, providing anti-aircraft defense for replenishment areas, although she was present off Okinawa at various points. That was, more or less, her duty for the remainder of the war with the result that Wimbrel was in Sydney, Australia when Japan surrendered in August 1945. She would then sail to Hong Kong on August 20th to provide support for repatriation operations. On the upside, her time in the Pacific did see the most notable part of Wimbrel's service. She was present for the surrender ceremony in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd, 1945. By 1946, however, Wimbrel departed the Pacific and returned home, to promptly be put in reserve. The British had little use for the ship in a peacetime navy. As a result, she would remain there for the next few years, before being sold to Egypt in November 1949, where details on her service become, if anything, even sparser. The ship was renamed El Malik Farouk, and entered Egyptian naval service, where she would eventually be renamed a second time to Tariq in 1954. 
That has remained the ship's name ever since. Her actual service under that name is more of an open question. Just like with Operation Husky, I imagine if there was anything major, it would have been written down. So it's fairly likely Tariq didn't get up to much in the various Arab-Israeli conflicts. Certainly she wasn't sunk like Ming's, or rather El Kahir, was. Just like with Zenith or El Fateh, I imagine it was mostly training duty. Tariq was probably used for similar duties as the British, at least at first. Patrol and escort. But as these ships age showed and technology marched on, she was probably shifted to more training than combat duty. Although, at least in 1974, the ship was still being used. Because there's a nice set of images, that I've been using for a while now, of the ship in Yugoslavia. These came from a visit to Croatia in August 1974, courtesy of Maritime Quest. In these pictures, Tariq is little changed from her British service. That, coupled with dry dock images from 2004, indicate the ship was never modernized to any real extent. Those 2003 to 2005 dry dock images are rough. The ship is in pretty bad shape below the waterline and on the interior. Her topside looks decently good, but that's not saying much. The ship was clearly out of service by this point, I would think. However, details are even sparse in regard to when the ship left service. Navalhistory.net indicates she was still in use as a training and accommodation ship in 1990. At the same time, the sloop was laid up for potential disposal by 2005. So the most likely answer is retired at the turn of the century. For the rest of the video, and Tariq's story, I'll be relying on Google Earth more than written sources. The march of technology is sometimes beneficial in this regard. The first good quality pictures come in 2009. This one from February is rougher, but if that's Tariq, she's got a rather nasty list. At least it looks like it. If so, that was corrected by the time El Fateh was moved alongside in May of 2009. At this point, the two ships would be mooring partners until the ex-Zenith was scrapped. This held true even when moved in 2013 to a different berth. Interestingly, even at this point, Tariq still had her guns fitted. Those would, in fact, remain until at least 2014. Although, by the end of that year, they were gone, and Tariq was moved to her old berth, where she would remain until September of 2016, while Zenith was scrapped. She was then moved to a different mooring from 2018 through 2021. During her time here, the ship seemed to develop another list. It's very notable in 2019, though it seems to have been corrected by the end of that year, only to come back in July 2021. It wouldn't surprise me if this is why the ship was moved again. Although the list could just be the angle of the image. Eventually the ship would end up in a new dry dock area. Specifically August of 2021. You can only glean so much from satellite imagery of course. If anyone happens to have seen the ship in person, by all means let me know. But from 2021 through to this year, She's been in the same spot, and in more or less the same condition. As of the Zenith video, the furthest along we had was May of 2023, where the ship is pretty much intact, with no major signs of scrapping. That was a couple years in the same spot, in roughly the same condition. Why? Your guess is as good as mine, although the hull might not be watertight anymore. And we now have an updated shot from March of 2024, where nothing has changed, other than some water towards the stern, which may or may not mean anything. There might, and I really need to emphasize might, be evidence of scrapping on the stern. It's hard to say for sure with what we have. It could just be shadows. Without being able to see the ship in person, I really can't say. In any case, since the early 2000s, 
There have been attempts to get the ship to Britain as a museum. The last update on that, at least that I'm aware of, came in 2016, which has come to nothing since then. While the ship hasn't been scrapped yet, her condition is apparently pretty bad. While I would love to see Tariq or Wimbrel as a museum, this is one case where I'd be very surprised if that happened. I'm not ruling it out. But, as things currently stand, it doesn't seem very likely. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content. And I'll see you in the next one.